Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to another Sabbath worship time. It's good to see you all here today. Beautiful weather outside, a bit humid last night, though. But, uh, it probably won't get any better now until June. <laughs> Here we got most of regular Charlene, good to see you here. Kevin and uh, Trish, good to see you along again. Ray, uh, Steve, you're a regular now. So Sh Shanara, you're a regular too. And everybody else, Rob and Elvie, you're regulars also. So that's, that's good. Colleen's not here at the moment. She may turn up, Colleen uh, Vincent. But look, if you get a chance and, um, and you remember... Please thank her for the lovely flowers. She, she's, uh, for the time being, must have quite a few flowers in her garden and is happy to cut them, bring them in on a Friday evening, and then she turns up on a Sabbath morning and arranges them, and yeah, and we really appreciate it. All right, let's just um, bring you up to date with the, um, with the announcements. We're looking at the Fifth Commandment today as part of our series. Um, our offering today is for local church and please remember what Gary mentioned last week because of the uh, COVID pandemic we are unable to carry out our door, our door knock appeal or the visiting appeal that we do here and they're asking that the burden fall back on us to make a special offering and when you make that special offering would you just put it in a tithe envelope if you want a tax receipt, put your name on the tithe envelope and we'll organise a tax receipt for you. If you don't worry, if you don't, you're not into tax receipts for charities and donations, then just put it in the tithe envelope and mark it as ADRA, ADRA appeal on, in, on the inside and the, when the treasurers get to it, we'll put it into the right uh, place and uh, it'll help to alleviate the shortfall, which I might add is a major shortfall as you can imagine. Our sing-along this evening is at 5.30 p.m. and uh, Graham's leading the singing and Glenda is sharing a little uh, devotional afterwards. Our uh, Bible study on Tuesday night we're looking at a five-minute video clip again on Martin Luther where he made the famous statement here I stand and we're working through Proverbs chapter 10. And those uh, Proverbs uh, discussions are quite, quite enjoyable. Well, I'm enjoying it. Um, now, for Thanksgiving planning, I'm wondering if, and we'll let Laurie know, Leone, can you make it uh, after prayer meeting on the Tuesday evening, this Tuesday evening? Because we, uh, Julie and I are away from November 10 to 17. That's right. Just, just, and there'll be one Sabbath out. Uh, so... I don't worry about the piano. You've got two, two good musicians there. That, that's a worry. And Di said this morning, we don't know. Uh, Glenda said this morning, we don't worry anymore. Okay, uh, tomorrow at one o'clock. One o'clock tomorrow, down at the Lone Pine uh, picnic area, there is a combined churches picnic. And if you can possibly make it, please come along. It's a really great time of fellowship with other uh, Christians around the island and um, yeah, just a good time to catch up. CHIP is down to its second to last week. No, we have this last week coming up and those who have been coming are going to um, cook their favourite CHIP dish. Uh, not chips, but CHIP dish. Uh, just a subtle difference. <coughs> Actually, not so subtle. Um, but um, that's this Thursday night. But this last one, last week, we, we learnt about our feelings and how that, the impact our feelings have on the way we actually live um, and our emotions. And Dr. Darren Morton um, gave five uh, things to help control that. Eat nutritiously, which Chip's been very, is a major for Chip. Move dynamically, which is get up out of your chairs and keep moving. Try and get 10,000 steps a day. Um, and that's not as easy for some as you might think. Get out into nature. That is a major. Those of you that are on Darlene's Facebook page, you'll know that she's out there on a regular basis. It helps to keep her sane. 
Um, but getting out into nature is just a wonderful way to go and to be. Um, get yourself good rest. In other words, regular sleep on a regular basis and to enjoy a Sabbath rest. That's important as well. And try to frame your world in positivity. Look for the positive in life experiences. And the positive side is helped by asking these three questions. What am I thankful for? What am I excited about that's going to happen in the future? And what can I do to make someone else feel good? And um, those, those three questions, if you practice those daily, your life takes on a more positive hue. I'm going to do that last one. What can I do to make someone else feel good? Colleen, it's good to have you along. And um, I'm glad you came because I just want to say the flowers are absolutely beautiful. And so for the time you spend picking, bringing them around to church, putting them in the vases and making them look pretty spectacular, we'd like to say thank you. And we do appreciate it. And I hope you feel good. Because if you don't, that was just a total waste of time. In <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget today that uh, we still have social distancing um, around. All right. Um, Charlene and Di, would you like to lead us in our song service, please? Well, you can gather what the song is because you will recognize the tune, so let us sing well. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, show it to the let his praises ring. Glory to the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing.
Seek the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our gracious Father in heaven, we count it a privilege that we're able to come and worship you on this beautiful Sabbath morning. I want to thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings you've given to each one of us, our families, this island, keeping it uh, from the pandemic from it. We thank you for that, dear Lord, and we pray that it may be that we never get it. Lord, I pray for those who are not in the best of health. We have loved ones right here in this church, dear Lord, that are not well. We have loved ones that are not well. There are people in the hospital not well. And those on the randal, Lord, we ask that you be near to them today as well. As we look around the world, Lord, and see the things happening in many countries, terrible things are happening just goes to show what's going to happen before Jesus comes. Lord, I ask that you'll be with Ken this morning as he takes the service. Words will be spoken that will encourage us to walk with you. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will come into our hearts and draw us closer together. We're living in times there, Lord, where the devil wants to divide us. And I ask, Lord, that you will keep him at bay, that your Holy Spirit will help each of us to do those things which are right because they are right. So Lord, I ask that you'll be with those traveling to and from the island today, where they have safe journey, and those that will be leaving tomorrow as well, we pray that they'll have safe journey as well. So Lord, accept us, each one this morning. Keep us all under the shadow of your wing, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'll ask the deacons if they wait upon you for the morning offering. opportunity of returning to you your tithes and our offerings. We pray, Lord, that these money may be multiplied for the service of your work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We further this service with him 520. 520.
we're continuing our um, commandment series. As you remember, we do one a month. Now, you've probably done the maths already and thought, now, hang on, we're into the tenth month and only up to the fifth commandment. What's going on? Interruptions. Best laid plans of mice and men. The, uh, it's typical of school teachers. You plan the year. You plan your terms, but you always know that something's going to happen that'll throw things out. And what with Mother's Day and Father's Day and the Pacific Peace Day and goodness knows what else, it's not that I've been absent, it's just that other things have cropped up. So that's, that's the reason for that. But today I thought we would take a look at this one, honour your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And it's a bit of a challenge because the majority of us here, our parents, we've either lost one or both of our parents. And so it's kind of pointless preaching to you and saying, well, you've got to honour your parents. So there's a few that that fits, but on the other hand, we are most, or well, many of us here, the majority again, are parents, grandparents, and in some cases, great-grandparents. And believe it or not, we still have an impact on our children, we still have an impact on our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And so I want you to keep that in mind because I tend to switch from preaching to those who have parents and preaching to those who have children, but it's all, it's all contained and it's all addressed in this fifth commandment. As you look around the world, you'd have to be absolutely blind and disconnected not to get the feeling that families are becoming disconnected. More and more families are becoming dysfunctional. And in fact, the whole, the whole family structure is broadening immensely. When Moses wrote this, the traditional family was father and mother. When God wrote this on tables of stone, his ideal for the family was father and mother. That's his ideal. We have now stretched that a lot further. But increasingly, the family unit is coming under attack internationally. Now, in Sweden, which is a model for this movement, you can't discipline your children in any way at all. You can't put them in time out. You can't deprive them even from watching TV. There is nothing you can do to contain them. And the laws are in, in, enforced by social workers, special courts, and the police. Now, I know it gets bad in the shopping centres. If you take a swipe at one of your kids, you'll probably end up in court anyway. But to actually get into your own homes, it's, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a worry. In Canada, if your children don't like you, they can take you to court and divorce you. You are no longer their parents if the children can present the case to the court. This is how far the world has fallen to. Years ago, it was the Duke of Windsor who observed, the thing that impresses me about America, he said, is the way the parents obey their children. That's just a bit of a backhanded compliment, isn't it? And this widespread disregard for parental authority over children, coupled with the influence of psychology, which has advised us not to do anything to stifle a child's emotion or, we may, or damage their self-esteem, has led for disregard even in Christian circles for keeping the fifth commandment, honour your father and the mother. Paul talks about it like this. Children, he says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may well be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. The fifth commandment is a pivotal commandment. It's a turning point, because the first four commandments are about our relationship with God, and now the following six, commencing with the fifth, is about our relationship with humanity, with, with, with others. It's important, though, that we remember the four that come first, our relationship with God. We've got to get the vertical correct first before we start worrying about the horizontal. 
You can't live in a world where you just think about the horizontal and forget the vertical. If you think you can, go and read the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, the wisest man that had ever lived, had reached a point in his life where all he was worried about was the horizontal. He had built everything. He had written a whole heap of stuff. He had invented music. He had tasted fun and pleasure. And then, before you know it, he's crying out, vanity of vanities. It's all a total waste of time, he says. There's no purpose to it. And then you come to the very end, and he, gets, he, he figures it out. Now, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of this whole book, about 12 chapters of it. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. If you want a life that hangs together, connect the vertical. You've got to have the vertical. And there are so many people today who lose their way totally because there is no vertical connection. They try to make do with the horizontal and it's not enough. And by the vertical here, of course, Solomon makes it plain. Fear God and keep his commandments. So the Ten Commandments start with our relationship with God, then it moves into our relationship with mankind. And if you want to be right with others... And, what, and with your relationships with your father and your mother and with your children, you've got to respect this vertical connection first and make sure that that is going right. Because when the home decays, the church decays. When the church decays, the community decays. And when the community decays, society goes down and then the nation follows. When your religion doesn't begin at home, it just doesn't begin. It's got to start in the home. And often I've wondered about this commandment, um, honour your father and your mother, and then there's, as Paul says, it's the only commandment that has a promise. You're going to live a long time in the land. And then you think, now hang on, hang on. I know a lot of kids who did honour their parents, but they never lived long in the land. Their lives were cut short. Where does this fit? I think we need to step back a bit and see the big picture. And if you take a look at history, where nations had stable and strong family units, they were usually a strong and stable nation. But as soon as a family unit started to break down, then the nation started to crumble. And at the risk of going on TV and saying it, I think America is demonstrating that today. It's, it's, it's a country in crisis and I'm not sure which way it's going to go and what will happen. But it will have serious international repercussions, I'm sure, because for a long time now we have seen families slowly breaking down. This word honour is a Hebrew word which means to attach value, significance and weight. It was used often as a term linked to money. The more silver you had, the heavier it weighed, of course, the more gold, those precious metals, this word was related to that. We now attach that to when you say honour your father and mother, it's like giving them the weight that they deserve, that they were created with, and we're not talking kilos here. In fact, I remember my grandmother would often say to me, she had two expressions, one that doesn't apply to this commandment, but one that did, and it was, you are worth your weight in gold. In other words, you are honourable, to put a highfalutin term to it. And usually it was because I'd said something nice, I'd done something nice, I don't know. But she would often say, you're worth your weight in gold. And I, I, I enjoyed that compliment whenever it came. So that the heavier a bar of gold is, of course, the more value it has. We attach a lot and should attach a lot of value to our parents and to our children. We need to esteem them and we need to respect them. Don't be like the six-year-old boy playing in the backyard. His mother was calling out over the fence, Billy, it's time to come home. She called him three times without any response from Billy. And his playmate said to him, hey, your mum's calling you. 
you need to go home. Nah, he says, she's only called me three times. I don't know how many times he was waiting to be called, but three wasn't enough. This word honour also means to glory, and it's a reference to God. To glorify God means to attach the utmost importance to him and place him in, highest, uh, in, in the highest position in your life. When we apply it to parents, it means to respect them and give them the honour that they are due. Standing at the head of the second section, the commandment to honour our parents, is foundational to keeping all of the others. We need to encourage our children and our grandchildren to honour their parents by not disgracing them with murder, with telling lies, with stealing, with being de discontent and having covetousness. The, the fifth commandment works back towards the first four because if, if they are rebellious towards their God, they'll be rebellious towards their parents. If they disrespect their parents, they will also disrespect God. The two are closely linked. It's interesting um, when you think of rain that falls on the Great Dividing Range in Australia. It's possible that two drops of water can land next to each other, one end up draining into the Pacific Ocean and the other one ending up draining into the Australian Bight, Great Australian Bight. Possible. In fact, it probably, it probably does happen, you just don't notice it. Two drops that can arrive in the same place at the same time and yet end up thousands of miles apart. Children can be like that too. I have a colleague who has a responsible position at the division office. His twin brother has absolutely nothing to do with our church anymore. And yet they were both brought up. They are identical twins, so they have the same DNA. They were raised in the same home, went to the same churches, went to the same schools, did everything together. One has decided church and God and Christianity isn't for him. The other one is a stalwart. How does that happen? Regardless of how you have been brought up, regardless of how you bring your children up, there is a choice that is still to be made and a choice that will be made. And somehow we have to get it through to our children and our grandchildren that the best choice to make is to abide by what Solomon says, keep the commandments and honour God. Sometimes we, we, we probably fail to appreciate how important it is in God's eyes that we have obedient children or children who will honour their parents. Roman, uh, Paul's talking about the end of the age and the type of people that won't make it to the kingdom. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy and murder, and strife, and deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil, and they disobey their parents. And you think, well, hey, hey, hang on. Disobeying parents isn't that bad. Well, Paul's gone and lumped them in with a fairly uh, terrible bunch of people. And if it's a, an habitual uh, relationship or an an habitual approach to authority, they usually grow up having problems living in a society that requires some rules and regulations in order to control the way society is. For a society that doesn't have any regulations or any rules, it's not long before total anarchy takes over. And you only have to look at some of the countries and what they went through when communism uh, broke down and failed in their countries when there was nothing left. The powerful were the ones that took over and it was just absolute chaos and anarchy. So that we as parents, grandparents, great-grandparents have a responsibility to teach our children about God, the fact that he loves them, that he wants them in his kingdom, we need to be able to show these children what God's love looks like 
so that they will want to respond positively to him. Paul also says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. And notice that terrible list also includes that disobedience part, that inability to respect their parents and conversely the inability of these some of these parents to respect their children what is God saying he's saying as time comes to a close families are going to be impacted parents will fail to protect their children and become the abusers even spiritual abusers we as grandparents need to be on guard and work against that sort of religion becoming established in a home. I read an interesting article this morning of a young girl who had been spiritually abused as an Adventist and I just couldn't believe that some people could think that some of the things that they were doing is the right thing to do. Like putting a chain around your refrigerator so the kids couldn't eat on Sabbath. Um, oh, some of the other stuff watching no TV, not only on Sabbath, but during the whole week because it wouldn't make them holy. Fortunately for her, she has managed to remain true to the faith and has seen through what was going on. But what is interesting is that there are some hymns that she hears sung in church that she has to walk out into the foyer. She can't handle it. And she says if she gets a uh, energetic and on fire passionate preacher she has to get up and leave it brings back it triggers immediately terrible feelings of guilt and shame in her about her unperfect condition that was drummed in uh, through that kind of preacher when she was a, a child with a and a, and a forming mind absolutely amazing um, but she she's she's hung in there and she's written this excellent article. And it's, it's a bit sobering. But even this, you see, is, is, is part of the whole devil's trap. If he, he knows, if he can break the family in some way, he's won. Because eventually, as I said before, it'll lead to the breakdown in, so in society, and the breakdown of society will lead to the breakdown of a nation, and he's happy. He knows he's lost the battle, but he's not about to give up the fight. He's just going to keep going to the bitter end to take as many out from God as he possibly can. So what are some of the things? What are the, let's, let's turn towards the more positive uh, things about, about, uh, being, uh, uh, about the way we honour our parents. Solomon says here, he who gathers crops in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. In other words, it is good that we get our children and grandchildren and, grandch and great-grandchildren reinforce with them the dignity of labour. To do your honest part around the home. It's good to encourage our parents, our children who are now parents, to ensure that chores are done on a regular basis. And it works in several ways. Number one, there's this feeling of accomplishment when the job is well done. I remember talking to a mother once who was complaining that Johnny could not put his shoes on. He was four years old and he couldn't put his shoes on. And I said, what do you mean he can't put his shoes on? She says, he can't. I said, is there something wrong with Johnny? No. I said, so what happens? Well, when it's time for him to be go to preschool, I have to put his shoes on. And I've got so many other things to do. I said, well, why don't you let Johnny walk to preschool in bare feet? Oh, no, he might cut himself on a piece of glass. I said, well, consequence. Make him walk bare feet. He'll soon change his mind. But you see, the problem with that is we take it further down the years and Johnny's getting into the habit of not doing anything because he's stubborn. And by the time he's 10, 11 and 12, he starts to believe he can't do anything 
and there goes his self-esteem and who he is. He's never had satisfaction of building something, creating something, finishing something, and it's over, really. And there's a high level of pre-teen and early teen suicide working across our communities for the simple reason that mum and dad never stopped stepped in to make their Johnny and Mary, sorry Mary, um, do even a simple task. I have a Howells Luca 5. Anyway, he received a pretty big Lego set. You know, it took him hours. It took him hours, but he finished it followed the page instructions. Now you get people criticising Lego and saying it stifles creativity. Well, I don't care about stifling creativity at that age. Well, he goes out and creates all sorts of stuff, so that's not a problem with him. But it taught him to stick at a job. Stick at it, stick at it, stick at it. And then when this machine was made, and it actually worked, his eyes just... Did that? Secret, did it works. And there is a level of self-pride. And he knows that he can make things. And it's important for young kids to do that. There was a boy who was at school talking to one of his friends. He said, you know, I'm really worried. And his friend said, what are you worried about? He said, well, my dad works so hard to provide the needs of our home. And mum washes the clothes and prepares the meals and she keeps the house clean in this room. So, so what in the world do you worry about? The boy replied, I'm afraid they might escape. <laughs> and maybe in that family, the father should have been helping the boy or teaching the boy how to do some of the work around the home too. Like mowing lawns, chopping firewood if they have a wood-fired thing for winter and so on. As grandparents and great-grandparents, we need to be able to demonstrate to our grandchildren the value of the dignity of labour. It's not a dirty task to have to get out in the garden and grub the weeds. I hated it as a child. Flat grass especially, I cannot tolerate flat grass because it brings back memories of the hot sun, mum having to give us a hiding from time to time <laughs> to get into it and pull the rotten weeds out. I actually don't mind doing it now, except flat grass. I just need to attack it with a roundup. All right. If a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. We live in a social welfare society, and there is good reason for it. Now, I'm not downing it totally. But what distresses me sometimes is the, is the, what's the word, almost emasculating, the taking away of the opportunity and the desire to do something for ourselves even though we might be down on our luck. We don't normally, we haven't normally had the doll here on Norfolk, but I understand that some are becoming quite happy to receive it without trying to do any work at all. And it's a shame. There should be something, as Paul says here, if a widow even has children or grandchildren, those kids should be learning to do the best they can to take care of what, they, what their needs are. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Family units were designed to operate as independent units to a certain extent, not relying on the the generosity and the goodness of others to keep them going. And if in fact you become, or if in fact families get to the point where they don't want to provide for their relations or themselves, they've denied the faith, says Paul. Being a Christian doesn't mean that we sit back and let everybody supply our needs because the Lord is going to impress upon them what our need is. Being a Christian means taking care of everybody else's needs as much as possible and ours as well. We should, as I've been saying, live um, uh, worthy of our children's honour. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. 
Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And fathers have been known often to exasperate their kids, either by being too hard, too firm unnecessarily, not listening. We're not good talkers, men, usually, and we're poor listeners as well. But we should be doing what we can instead to be godly in front of our children. Children will listen more to our lives than they will listen to our lectures. It's just the way we are made. And if we want our children to grow up in the Lord, then we as fathers need to reflect that and make sure that we are putting that message out as people who um, take time out on a regular basis to connect with God. It means controlling our anger towards our mates and our children. It means being an example of godliness in word and in deed. And when we've made a mistake, to humbly confess that we made a mistake. Not pass it off, not pretend it never happened, not ignore the impact it's had on the kids, but rather pull them aside and confess to them that we are not perfect. It means too that you'll need to take time to tell them stories about your own upbringing, the good and the bad, not just the good. It helps, I think, it helps children to gain a more balanced approach to life, to realise that their parents were never perfect, but they hopefully have turned out okay, and it will give the kids hope as well. But some would say, but what about if my parents aren't honourable? What if they've done things that aren't right? The Bible doesn't make any excuses for that situation. It just simply says, continue to honour them. But we need to acknowledge that the, our parents are not perfect. We need to remember that God still loves them. We need to remember that we have all sinned. But we also need to remember that what they have done to their children was and is wrong. But the Bible still clearly requires honour, respect, forgiveness and agape love. And by agape love I mean the love that you extend to a person because it is the right thing to do. Regardless of what they've done to you, you, you treat them in a way that is right. Because we have to remember that none of us are perfect. And it is the way that Jesus would treat other people too. And we need to remember that in situations like this, God does not remain aloof. He doesn't set up that commandment and say, there you go, you keep it. And if you struggle, and if it's going to backfire on you, oh, don't come to me. He's not like that. He's right there beside you saying, we can do this together. It's not the best. That's the world we're in. But hang in there because there's a better day coming. I like one of the Grimm's brothers' fairy tales, and it goes something like this. You might have heard about it. Might have, you probably have heard it. Of the elderly man who lived with his son and daughter-in-law. His eyes blinked and his hands trembled, and he, when he ate, he clattered the silverware distressingly, slopped the food all over the place. It often missed his mouth. And he dribbled a lot on the tablecloth. And his son didn't like the arrangement. I can't have you eating like this at my table, Dad, he said. It interferes with my right to happiness. So he and his wife took the old man gently, but firmly by the arm, and led him to the corner of the kitchen, where they set him up on a stool and gave him his food in a bowl. And from then on, he, was all, he always ate in the corner, eating out of a bowl. And then one day his hands trembled a bit more, and he couldn't hold the bowl, and the bowl fell and broke. Ah, oh, you're a pig, said the son. You, if you're going to be like a pig, you're going to eat like a pig. And so they made him a wooden trough, and he got his meals and that. But they had a four-year-old son, whom the grandfather was very fond of. And one evening the son was noticed playing on the floor different bits of wood, trying to put them together. And the father said, son, what are you doing? And he looked up with smiling for approval, and he says, well, I, I'm uh, making a trough a trough to feed you and mum when you get really old. And the son looked at, the, the, the son looked at his wife and at each other and thought, oh dear. And they cried a little 
And they went to the corner and of course they took the old man and they led him back to the table and they let him eat his food in joy and happiness again. The way we treat our children will often be the way they will end up treating us as they get older. That's a salutary thought. Listen, my son, says Proverbs uh, Solomon again, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to your, adore your neck. One of the biggest challenges in raising a family is how do you teach your children the values you have as a family in such a way that they, free, with their free will, want to take it on and, and emulate it rather than forcing it on them. I confess I must have, I've probably come very close with my own children, but I would often say to them, that is not the Wesleyan way. And sometimes I'd do it to pull rank, but really, it, it was true. There were times when they would do something, and I'd just simply say, listen, you guys, that's not the Wesleyan way. What's happened? That's not the way we do it around here. And it's important that you have family values. And those, fa those values are the things that your family is known for and that your family will stick up for. It helps children to gain a sense of identity, of who they are. It helps to create a strong family unit. And it's important if you want honour in your family that you teach your children how to heed counsel, how to accept advice. But as I said before, the, the challenge for parents today is to do it in such a way that they want to take it on, that they want to be a proud Weslake or whoever it is they are. Our daughter Amy is, has become fascinated, well, probably more than fascinated, with genealogy. And the stuff she is digging up, I don't know where she's got it from, from both sides of the family. But it's, it's, it's part of telling her family story to her kids as well so that they know where they come from. And as I've said here before, it's all very well to know my bounty mutineering heritage. But if I go back to Matthew Quintle, there's 127 other heritage stories that sit on the same level as he does, being the seventh generation back. And I wonder what, what their stories are. Are they exotic stories, exciting stories, or are they just the mundane, ordinary people stories? I suspect most of us have just ordinary people stories. But you see, God's kingdom kingdom is made up of ordinary people and for that we can be very very thankful so this commandment points out clearly that there are benefits not only to a family but to a community and ultimately the nation when children are taught by instruction and example to honor their parents to treat them with respect treat our children with respect and for them to treat us with respect I remember once we were up at the uh, cow shed and I referred to one of my mate's father as his old man. So and so, oh, you know his old man? I was talking to Dad. <laughs> Dad's face came here. <laughs> Don't you ever call anybody's father old man. That is disrespectful. I consider myself fortunate not to get a hiding for, <laughs> hiding for it. But you know, even to today, I cannot use that term. I cannot talk about someone's old man. And even when I hear that term, I, 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 I cringe inside. <laughs> I don't know if that method would work today. You'd, you'd, you'd be in trouble. Well, I, well, no, you wouldn't, but... So often things happen and we don't pull a child up and say, listen, that's not our way of speaking around here. That's not our way of doing. You've got to make sure that you then aren't heard talking about somebody else's old man. Because if they hear that from you, you're done for. And it's, uh, you've done a disservice to them. 
It's not, this commandment isn't predicated on whether parents deserve the love and respect that God commands them to receive. In the same way, God loves each of us regardless of how good or evil we may be. But if we take the time to honour our parents and to teach our children and grandchildren to do likewise, then God's command, the first with the promise, as Paul says, will ensure that we and our families will live long in this beautiful island that God has given us. Let's close, shall we, by singing hymn number 655, Happy the Home. Father, we thank you that you have given us this commandment. We pray, please, that you will help each of us to encourage not only our parents and those that we have, but our children and our grandchildren to great-grandchildren as well, as ever the case may be, to be respect respectful and to honour each other because in honouring them we do indeed honour you. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.